Madonna opens up for the first time since adopting her twins about life as a mom. It's in this week's People Cover Story. After Ever's birth, about a year and four months, that was when I spoke to a doctor for the first time who said, this isn't going to get any better, and let's let's bring you in and have an actual conversation about what might help you. Alanis Morissette opening up about her battle with postpartum depression. Luann talking to people about her next steps after divorce. And why Princess Kate might go for baby number four. Plus, Emma looks like with her British accent, which I'm not going to attempt. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's okay. You're, you're beautiful, darling, or whatever. <laughs> Something sweet and British. The cast of the new movie It is here sharing some of their coolest experiences meeting huge movie stars. I and mean, we cannot wait for this movie. Woo. Yes, very excited to hear from the cast of It this morning. Good morning, Facebook Live and People.com. Welcome to People Now. In honor of this week's People Cover Story, we are talking all things Madonna. We want to know, what is your favorite Madonna song? It's our Facebook question of the day. Let us know your answers in the comments below. But first, here's what you need to know and what's trending today. Madonna graces the cover of this week's People magazine with four of her six children. For the first time since adopting her twins, Esther and Stella, the pop icon reveals her life as a mom and her emotional adoption journey. In February, Madonna adopted her twins from Malawi, the same country from which she adopted son David Banda and daughter Mercy James, who are both 11 years old. She's also mom to Lourdes, who is 20, with ex Carlos Leon, and son Rocco, who is 17, with ex Guy Ritchie. In July, the singer invited people to join her in Malawi for the opening of the Mercy James Center for Pediatric Surgery and Intensive Care, the country's first ever children's hospital. This building is the result of many dedicated people, and I am grateful to each and every one of you for helping me make this dream a reality. Now, in her interview, Madonna reflects back on the scrutiny she received over her adoption of son David, who she first met while visiting a hospital in 2006. David was battling pneumonia and malaria at the time. Two years later, in 2008, when she brought him home, she remembers headlines claiming she kidnapped David and thinking, wait a minute, I'm trying to save somebody's life. Why are you all expletive on me right now? She says she would cry herself to sleep, calling it a, quote, low point for her. She brought home Mercy James back in June 2009 after a battle with the Supreme Court in Malawi. She reveals adopting twins Esther and Stella was a different experience because she asked her kids about extending their family first. Mercy and David were excited, but the singer describes Lourdes and Rocco's reaction as being more of a feeling of, oh, we have to share you with more people. Eventually, Lola said, Mom, if that's what you want and it's going to make you happy, let's go. Madonna's youngest four affectionately call her Mambo, and she also admits playing the role of bad cop is one of her biggest challenges. Neither Mercy nor David have cell phones, even though all their friends do, but she says she's okay with that. I'm glad to hear from Madonna. Moving on to this, Alanis Morissette is opening up about her battle with postpartum depression. The 43-year-old reveals in an interview with People that she suffered from the disease after her first baby and then again after her second child, four times worse. Identifying the experience with being on a roller coaster, the singer admits she's been dealing with the depression since last summer. After Ever's birth, about a year and four months, that was when I spoke to a doctor for the first time who said, this isn't going to get any better, and let's let's bring you in and have an actual conversation about what might help you. Morissette details her experiences with her first bout in 2010 with son Ever. She says she began feeling symptoms including intense physical pain, insomnia, lethargy, and quote, horrifying, scary visions of her family being harmed. Calling the experience very isolating, the 43-year-old was diagnosed with PPD and immediately began a combination of medication and homeopathic treatment. With time, the singer says she began to see some relief and planned to have another baby with husband Mario Soli Treadway. What she did not expect was the PPD would not only come back with the birth of daughter Onyx, but it would be four times worse than her initial experience with her son. There's a lot of sleeplessness. The more severe the postpartum depression, the harder it is to have that time alone. So I seek it and, and have it, you know, at three in the morning sometimes. So sleep is hard to come by. And I push through the being debilitated, but knowing that I need to provide and show up because I see my little kids' faces. And I'm so empathic with them and so bonded with them that if they need me, they have me. You know, even if I have to sort of stay lying down and go, come, 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 you know, so they might 
They might think, oh, mommy's just tired. I want to keep as much semblance of normalcy for my kids as I can. So I don't want it to be their burden. Alanis Morissette also revealing her PPD has affected her seven-year marriage to husband Soli, but describes him as supportive. She's hoping that by speaking about her struggles with PPD, she can break the stigma surrounding the illness and end the silent suffering that comes with it. For more on Alanis Morissette's story about PPD, be sure to check out her full story streaming on the People Entertainment Weekly Network app. Well, guys, Princess Kate is pregnant with her third child, but could a fourth be in the works too? Although the Duchess of Cambridge jokingly admitted last year that she could, quote, do with a break after mommy and Prince George and Princess Charlotte, Kate, who is the oldest of three tight-knit siblings, always wanted a big family. And according to those close to the royal, it was never a question of if, but rather when the Fab Four would become five. Since Kate's pregnancy announcement, those within London and beyond are celebrating the good news, including residents of Kate's family village in Bucklebury, where her mother Carol and father Michael currently reside. One resident opening up to people about Carol and Michael's role as grandparents, saying Carol's a very close grandmother, so she and Michael will be beaming from ear to ear. I reckon Kate will try to emulate Queen Elizabeth and have four. Well, we certainly love to see that. Another resident who attended the royal couple's wedding back in 2011, adding, it's going to be nice for Carol to have three grandchildren, isn't it? She had three children herself, so I suppose it's what Kate is used to. I can't imagine Kate will want any more, given the ordeal that she goes through every pregnancy. I should think that three children is enough, but Carol will be absolutely over the moon. The locals are all very happy for her and the family. Kate is a really lovely girl. I guess we'll have to wait and see if the Fab Four becomes six one day. But in the meantime, we can't wait for baby number three, and we'll just keep our uh, excitement there for now. Now, after her brief seven-month marriage, Real Housewives of New York star Luanne de Lesseps is opening up about why her relationship with ex-husband Tom D'Agostino failed and how she is moving on. Speaking about the demise of her marriage, de Lesseps reveals, quote, there was a honeymoon period of about five months, but then Tom got caught in the press going out and meeting with ex-girlfriends. That caused a lot of fights. Going on to admit the last straw was a night in the Hamptons when D'Agostino went out alone to meet an ex and was caught by a slew of gossip magazines. After that, de Lesseps says she had, quote, had enough because there's only so many times you can take it. We were just spent, is what she said. But even though she says D'Agostino told her he wanted to live the life of a bachelor, she truly believes he never actually cheated on her, saying, quote, he assured me he wasn't, but that wasn't the perception of people around us. We live under the spotlight, so you can't act a certain way. You might be friends with your ex, but it doesn't look good. But I do believe he wasn't cheating, and I hope that was the case. De Lesep says the experience taught her, quote, you can't change people and that she still loves D'Agostino as a person, but says the breakup has been extremely difficult anyway. Admitting, quote, this has been one of the toughest times of my life. That and getting divorced the first time, I have a sense of failure and I hate to fail. I wake up at night and my bed feels empty now that he's gone. De Lesep says she's pulling through by throwing herself into various new projects and with the support of her kids and friends, including her Real Housewives castmates. She says, quote, they've all reached out for the most part. They feel bad because they know that my heart was in it. They supported me, even if they didn't agree with it. Bethany said, love is blind. I think she really wished me happiness in the end. And when it comes down to it, De Lesep says she doesn't regret the marriage and will always bounce back no matter what life throws at her. And as for getting married again, she admits, quote, Never say never. We'll see what happens. Well, guys, looks like the relaxing game of baseball just got a little more scandalous. The Boston Red Sox were reportedly accused of using an Apple Watch to steal signs from their rivals, the New York Yankees. The widespread and mostly hidden practice of sign stealing is rather common in the baseball world, although the practice has caused occasional rifts when it becomes too obvious. According to the New York Times report, the Yankees filed a detailed complaint two weeks ago with the commissioner's office that included video footage the Yankees had shot of a Red Sox staff member reportedly looking at his Apple Watch before relaying information to the Boston players. But not so fast. According to the Times report, the Red Sox filed a counter complaint accusing the Yankees of similar practices with electronics such as cameras, an accusation that manager Joe Giardi fully denies. Meanwhile, baseball commissioner Rob Manfred doesn't seem too shocked by the news, saying at a scheduled appearance at Fenway Park on Tuesday, when you have the kind of rivalry that the Yankees and the Red Sox have, I guess it's not shocking you could have charges and counter charges like this to the extent that there was a violation on either side. We are 100% comfortable that it is not an ongoing issue. It is currently unclear what penalties Manfred was considering should either team be found guilty, although his uh, repercussions would most likely include a fine or the loss of one or more draft picks. 
We'll see what happens with that. Scandalous. Very scandalous. All, right, All over the place this morning. Let's check in with Facebook Live. We're talking your favorite Madonna song. Kevin says it's impossible to choose only one song from a long list of hits. All right. Edward says like a prayer. I think that's on the top okay. of a lot of people's list. Stephanie says favorite Madonna song is Ray of Light. Love Madonna in the 90s. Nice. Ray of Light. That's right. good. That's really I good. I will refrain from singing <laughs> any more Madonna. Keep your comments coming in. Uh, we'll get to you again very soon. But first, Andrea Moore, Trinity News for us in Star Trek. Yes, Jeremy. Well, we are kicking off Star Trek with a TV rock star who is opening up about fashion. So this is us star Chrissy Metz is known for showing off her curves on the red carpet, but it wasn't always easy for the 36 year old actress. Growing up, Chrissy says she was quote, the only chubby girl in her friend group, revealing how no other stores carried her size besides plus size retailer Lane Bryant. Chrissy opened up to people about her fashion evolution, saying, my style started to shift when I moved to LA. I was 23. I had a roommate who wore funky clothes. I was like, if she can do it, I can do it. I would get vintage shirts and glitter some of the letters. I learned to express myself through accessories. I once made a purse out of an old Baskin Robbins ice cream tub, which is amazing. After reaching mega stardom as Kate on NBC's This Is Us, Chrissy's red carpet looks began to transform her style from creative and funky to daring and bold. She tells people, I never wore form-fitting dresses before. There are a lot of people who make you feel uncomfortable if you show a chubby stomach, arm, or leg. When I first started promoting This Is Us, I was worried about how things would photograph but I slowly gained confidence. I love bold colors and prints now. Chrissy singled out a floral gown she wore at the 2017 Critics' Choice Awards, describing the dress as something outside of her comfort zone, explaining, being a big girl, you want to hide sometimes. But with that dress, it was like, boom, I'm here in all my embroidered glory. Chrissy went on to describe another standout fashion moment, the burgundy latex dress she rocked at this year's MTV Movie Awards. A quote, personal victory for the rising star, Chrissy says she was surprised people were so up in arms over the outfit, adding, I was surprised because it was a baby doll silhouette I'd worn before, but everyone thought it was taboo. I showed a little more cleavage than usual. As people, we evolve and so do our fashion choices. In the future, the This Is Us star hopes to start her own clothing line where women of all shapes and sizes can enjoy what they're wearing. We say, keep doing you, Chrissy. Well, The Bachelor's Vanessa Grimaldi is speaking out about her split from Nick Vial. The former couple announced the split last month after getting engaged on last season's finale back in March. She tells people, the distance wasn't ever an issue. We tried really hard, but in the end, we just realized we were different people fighting to keep our relationship when we just weren't the best fit for each other. As for how she's doing today, Grimaldi admits that she, quote, fell in love hard with Vial, which made the breakup that much harder. Going on to say, quote, every part of you is shattered. I'm trying to pick up the pieces and know it's okay to grieve the loss and cry and curl up under the covers. I've done all those things. But moving forward, Grimaldi's outlook is surprisingly positive. She says she's trying to stay optimistic about the future and quote, remember that one day the person that I'm meant to be with, we will find our way to each other. It will always be okay in the end. Love to hear that. And those are your star tracks for today. All right, guys, stay with us. The Mindy Project's costume designer, Sal Perez, is giving us a special sneak peek inside Mindy Lahiri's fashionable closet. Plus, we sit down with the cast of It, who say Emma Watson confused them with the cast of Stranger Things. It is all true. Stick around for that story. This is King Cutie in People. His Royal Highness, Prince George Alexander Louis of Cambridge. These are George's parents, George's home, his Nana, the Queen, and his staff of 644 Englishmen. This is George's dog, Lupo, who inspired his favorite book, The Adventures of the Royal Dog, Lupo, one George will share now that he's a big brother. People. The details make the story. Don't miss this week's People. Every now and then there's a wardrobe malfunction, but normally we try to catch it. Um, this is this beautiful Roberta Cavalli dress with a deep V back. Um, Mindy puts it on and came with it reversed, so it had a deep V front. And I'm like, Mindy, that's great, but your dress is on backwards. And she's like, I like it that way, I'm gonna wear it that way. And so she actually wore the dress backwards. So I'm sure Roberto Cavalli was like, that's not how I intended the dress to be worn, but it looks great on her. I mean, leave it to Mindy Kaling to make a backwards dress look fashionable. It looks really good on her. Costume designer Sal Perez seems to know a lot when it comes to Mindy's fashion. Over 1,000 eye-popping costumes have been worn by the star on her hit Hulu series, The Mindy Project. Now, with the show's sixth and final season, both Perez and Mindy are ready to say goodbye. But we couldn't leave without taking a look back at all that head-to-toe fashion one last time. Watch.
When I first met with Mindy, she, you know, I was like, what, what do you need me for? It's a show about a doctor's office and lab coats and scrubs. And she said, no, no, no. I want the show to be aspirational. I want it to be all about fashion. And I want you to know who Mindy is by the way the clothes she wears. We really show her mood and what she's feeling through what she's wearing. When she's bright and happy and fun, the colors are bright and happy and fun. When she's a little more moody, the colors are more subdued. So I really want to tell the story through her costumes. In order to <laughs> stay ahead of the game, I have to shop a lot for Mindy. So about $100,000 of clothes come in every week. Um, and I've got to get them on Mindy to see what works and what doesn't so that we can either fit them or send them away. Um, we try to have a weekly fitting. Um, this, is a sh this is a small fitting this week because you know we, we have a lot of clothes. Um, but I've got a fitting with Mindy this afternoon and so we're taking all this to her office to fit her for the next few episodes. I think Mindy's off-screen style has sort of merged with her on-screen style. Um, you know, we get to work at five in the morning and I'll, you know, in, in, in the dawn, as I'm driving up to work, I'll see Mindy going to the makeup trailer, fully dressed in an outfit. I'm like, oh, did you have an interview this morning? She's like, no, I'm just dressed for work. And I love that, you know, even at five in the morning, Mindy now puts on a full ensemble because she just loves dressing up. The most iconic piece is really, it changes per season. I mean, I think that every season has one. I mean there was the great Christmas dress she wore that was green with the beaded wings. Um, there was a season one where she was on the top of the Empire State Building in that beautiful custom sort of 1970s inspired suit with polka dot uh, blouse and tie. Um, season four, she ended in that beautiful Madeline dress, the yellow one with the floral coat. And I love that we got to start season five with that same outfit. And so I got to wear it over two seasons, which made me very happy. And you know, up until this season where I just did a beautiful tassel coat for the premiere of the uh, uh, show. I think that, you know, we every year I try to top what I did last year, so her clothes have really gotten very extravagant. I think the style advice that Mindy Lahiri would give to Mindy Kaling is to be bold and colorful, have fun with clothes. Uh, you know, it's not a tattoo. Try something you wouldn't normally try in life. It could be fun. I think that people have so many fashion roles, and I don't think there should be fashion roles. This, you know, white after Labor Day, right, d daytime rhinestones. Uh, you know, I think that you should have fun with clothes. There shouldn't be any rules. Love all of those looks. And good news, guys, you can join in on the fun, too. Now through September 21st, People is teaming up with Charity Buzz to auction off some of Mindy's hottest accessories from the show. And the grand prize winner will receive a total of 12 accessories, plus a styling session with Perez and a People editor. All proceeds will be donated to the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, so make sure to donate today. This is Jennifer Lawrence in People. This is Jennifer photobombing Taylor Swift and Sarah Jessica Parker and Liam Hemsworth, proving that while we all love the fashion of the red carpet, it's people who steal the show. People, the details make the story. My goodness, it doesn't get much scarier than that, folks. Bill Skarsgård plays the ultra-creepy Pennywise in the newest big-screen adaptation of Stephen King's It's. And although he wasn't even born when the novel first came out, Bill reveals that he still remembers his older brothers, including True Blood star Alexander, warning him about the scary clown called Pennywise when he was just a child. Well, now he's 27, and Bill could not wait to terrify moviegoers with his creepy transformation, telling people, I was really excited to do a full character transformation, something so far away from who I am. Well, he did it. The actor admits that even after filming, Pennywise haunted his nightmares for weeks. But with the sequel already in the works, the actor doesn't have much time to be scared, revealing, I'm really looking forward to getting back under the clown makeup. And we are too, Bill. And guys, the young cast of It just stopped by and told us what happened when they met Emma Watson, watch this. When we were sitting um, at the table, we are like, you know, fanboying a little bit, fanboying groom. And we are like, hey, can we get a photo? And, you know, her manager like, you know, if we let you take a photo, then you know, everybody takes a photo. But Emma was like, with her British accent, which I'm not gonna attempt. Uh. <laughs> no, it's, it's okay, you're, you're beautiful darling, or whatever. Sweet, sweet. Something sweet and British. It's so it. great. And she sweet, let us take a British. British. Sweet and British, yeah. and uh, she let us take a photo with her, and I'll remember that for the rest of my I life. I think. But I love you. To love be you. fair, I love you, Emma, if I ever meet you, but I think that she thought you guys were the Stranger Things kids. Yeah, <laughs> no problem. Like, legit. It was like this. Like, I'm not joking. No, no, like, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, she did. She did. She definitely did. Yeah. You mistaken for no, the Stranger Things? No, I've chosen not a terrible thing. I've chosen not a, to not a bad thing. Exactly no, no. who I was my birthday. Okay, she, yeah, but you're not gonna, you're not willing to accept that. But I choose to believe. She knew who you were, and yeah. she, so she knew, she saw you or knew you, and maybe was told these are the good I, Stranger Things. Maybe like, I, uh, that, that's what I assume, just because it's like yeah. that's, that's what it said. Because that's what it said. <laughs> oh, okay. In her uh, Instagram post, she like posted it on her Instagram, she was, and she like edited it really quickly. Oh, she first put Stranger Things. Yeah, she's like with these. Like beautiful Stranger Things kids. <laughs> Cut in this some slack, guys. It hits theaters nationwide this Friday. We can't wait. You just released your debut full length album, Dirty South, in July. So, congratulations. Thank you very much. It's been a little over a month, but what has the fan reaction been like so far? It's been insane. I mean, we were number one on country record sales on billboards. Musician Lucas Hoag's debut full-length album, Dirty South, is our Toyota People Pick of the Day. Now, it's been topping charts since its July release, making him a new fan favorite for country fanatics. So much so that he's getting handmade gifts. He's also front and center for some pretty rowdy and adoring crowds. Watch this. I guess the craziest fan encounter would be in Sturgis, South Dakota. We were doing a show with uh, Montgomery Gentry up there. Mm -hmm. And have you ever been to Sturgis bike rally up there? I have not. It's insane, folks. <laughs> it sounds pretty insane, crazy. Insane, insane. <laughs> so uh, it's probably not something that we want to say on air, but it was a crazy encounter. Lots of little, very little clothing. You can say it on air. Very little clothing was, was involved. Ooh. Okay, wait, so like, did it, so people were like stripping? Or? Come up to the stage and like no top on, just covering up certain areas of the female anatomy. Now, have you ever gotten gifts or anything from the fans? Yes, one of my favorite gifts was a custom cornhole set. That's amazing. <laughs> this lady walks through the crowd with this giant big black bag and inside she pulls out these homemade cornhole sets with my logos all over them. It was really cool. Uh, are you are you good at cornhole? Yeah, I'm pretty good at cornhole. Do you still have those custom I cornhole? I do. You do? I still have them. They're in the backyard of my house. So I know one of your music role models is Garth Brooks. Think, yeah. You even have a song called The Power of Garth, which kind of honors the legend and his music. Definitely. So how did, how did his music motivate you growing up? So the first time I heard the No Fences album, I was blown away because, I mean, my dad was giving me, you know, Johnny Cash music and Skip mm -hmm. music and Paul Overstreet music and then my friend brings me the No Fences album, it's a CD and I'm like, what is going on? This is amazing. <laughs> is this the new country music? This is country music. Oh, I love it, you know? And it just started making me dive into the industry itself as a whole, like finding out who the songwriters are and wanting to start figuring out how to craft songs and do my own thing and become the artist that I that I knew I wanted to be even at a young age. So listening to his music, it's just, it's just so broad and so all over the place that he can do kind of the rock and country stuff and the super amazing ballads. And it was just something that encapsulated everything I wanted to be in country music. He's All right. Really nice guy. I know he was very nice. All right, and I love that he got cornhole bags from a fan because I love cornhole. I know it is really good. One thing. of the best, like especially like barbecue or camping yeah. games. All right. All right, let's check in with <laughs> Facebook Live. We've been asking you guys what your favorite Madonna song is. Uh, Diana says Vogue, and Lauren agrees that song always puts me in a good mood. A lot of people pointing out that it's hard to narrow it down to just one, and I agree yeah. with that. Uh, but Judy says my son loves the Hey Mr. DJ song. Liz says Express Yourself, Don't Go for Second Best Baby. Okay, I like Material Girl. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Vogue. Yeah. Another one, but I like. All right. <laughs> Madonna, all the hits. Uh, coming up tomorrow, guys, we have I Do Until I Don't actress Lake Bell opening up about her life as a working mama, plus uh, uh, Yana Williams, the lady with the longest fingernails from the Guinness Book of World Records. Look at those. She oh joins us goodness. live. You will not want to miss this. Makes me a little nervous. All right, thanks for watching. And for now, we leave you with one last thing from country star Lucas Hogue. Enjoy. Can she Hi, I'm Lucas Hogue, and this is One Last Thing. The last song stuck in my head was, it was Despacito. Despacito. The last show I binge watched was that 70s show, and I'm still binge watching it right now. I laugh out loud every time I watch it. The last time I was starstruck was this year at the ACM Awards in Las Vegas. I'm standing on the red carpet, and across walks David Copperfield. Huge fan. And I got to say hello and talk to him. It's pretty cool.